Good morning. Welcome to our series, Raising Women's Voices. I'm Jane Corhonan, and I'm a partner and portfolio manager at Brown Advisory. We want launched this series because we felt that we were not hearing directly from women about issues that matter during this challenging time. The ongoing pandemic, the economic fallout, racial reckoning, climate crisis, political polarization, it's, it's a long list. It's our goal to elevate women's voices across a variety of disciplines and experiences and geographies so that we can still, we can all learn and expand our thinking together and drive collective action. I also want uh, to give a warm welcome to our friends from the International Women's Forum with whom we are partnering for today's discussion. We're proud of this long-term relationship uh, with the IWF. What an organization with over 7,000 members from 33 countries, many of whom are on our call today and are committed to connecting and elevating the community of women. So, so much has been written about the pandemic's gender effect, the she session. More plainly, persistent and growing racial inequities, the long-term impact of millions of women leaving the war workforce, not yet back, childcare options that are even scarcer and more expensive than before COVID, and the burden on mothers whose children are too young to be vaccinated and are struggling to balance safety, childcare and work, to name just some of the issues that prevail and will shape post-COVID resilience for us all. When we polled several hundred of our colleagues at Brown earlier this year about what topics we should address during our Raising Women's Voices series, the state of women globally was the clear first choice. We could not be more thrilled to have two experts with us today, Mary Ellen and Alicia, to help us unpack this topic, the big one and help us understand what each one of us can do to help. Mary Ellen Iskandarian is the CEO of Women's World Banking, an international NGO whose mission is to provide financial tools and capital to empower low-income women around the world. The organization serves more than 20 million micro entrepreneurs in 32 developing countries. As you'll hear, Mary Ellen is not only passionate about financial inclusion, uh, spoiler alert, she believes that we're at a true inflection point of opportunity for women. When we started talking with Mary Ellen about today's session, Alicia's name immediately came up. Alicia Ridesani Gupta is a gender reporter for the New York Times. Many of you, I'm sure, read her excellent twice-weekly newsletter in her words. Alicia has done a lot of really insightful reporting about the impact of the pandemic on women. Welcome to you both. I'm excited Thank to you. dive into this discussion, but before I do, I want to emphasize that we want to hear from all of you as well. Please use the Zoom Q&A function to ask your questions, and we're eager to hear what's on your minds. And my commitment to you is to resist the temptation to go beyond our hour together. <laughs> so let's get started. Mary Ellen, big question to help us frame our conversation. Your perspective is an international one and serving in your organization serves so many low-income women entrepreneurs. How are they doing at this point in the pandemic? You've talked about um, this being a moment of real opportunity. What's the good news you're seeing, but um, some of the pain points as well? Um, so first of all, thank you so much for uh, for including me in today's conversation. And as I mentioned, I'm a bit of a fangirl of Alicia's, so I'm super excited to be on this call with her. Um, have, I've just learned an enormous amount about really what's going on in my own country through um, through your work, Alicia. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, I, I think one one sort of clarification. I think it's really important, and a lot of the you know 
over the years, the microfinance myth, if you will, has always been about this woman entrepreneur. Not every woman is an entrepreneur, but every woman does need access to financial services. And so I think just to sort of open the, the, the lens a little bit, um, you know, our, we're committed, yes, to providing access to, to finance for women and women-owned companies, but also to make sure that all women have savings accounts, insurance, long-term retirement savings, um, and credit to smooth consumption or take advantage of, of good opportunities or education or you know all of the reasons, all of the things that, that you and I, Jane, use financial services for low-income women absolutely need need access to them. And you know that's been no less clear to us in this um, these 18 months of, of the pandemic. The reason I'm quite optimistic and really kind of excited about this moment of, of opportunity is that, you know, there has been a persistent gender gap um, it, across the emerging markets. There's been, as long as the data has been collected, as long as I've been in this industry, there's been at least a 9% on average gender gap. But in, in South Asia, those gaps tend to be closer to 20, 25, 30% in some countries. Um, you, see, you just have seen this persistent gap in access. And then when you take it sort of another double click and you look at digital financial services, and we've seen now for at least a decade that that is the way the, the government's private sector, uh, the, uh, the, the independent sector has really co coalesced around the idea that low cost, convenient financial services to low income populations are going to be delivered through digital technology. If, women are sort of relegated to the flip phone. So you don't have as large a gender gap with the traditional flip phone, but a very significant gap in mobile internet access. So the, you know, the smartphone, um, they're still going to be cut out of even this exciting new innovation. And so the reason for my, um, for my optimism is that you've seen a huge surge towards digital financial services with the pandemic as social distancing was necessary, as, um, as more and more product services became only available digitally. And it seems to have sort of cracked that, that cultural norm in many places of the women can't have that access to a, to a cell phone. You, the GSMA, the, the, global the Mobile Phone Industry Association just recently reported that you now, you know, and I know this is, this is gonna be a large number to say only about, but only a 15% gender gap in smartphone ownership, which is absolutely the first, um, gating factor, if you will, to financial inclusion today for low-income people in, in developing countries. Is some of that um, age, is there an age cohort that's helping to drive some of that as well? Or is this kind of endemic of all women? It, that's that's a that's a really great question. I think in in some countries, you know, you've you've literally seen financial service providers say, you know, we're not even going to go after, you know, women sort of middle-aged and, and up because, you know, the culture norm won't change, but the, the, US, the, you know, the younger population are sort of more digital natives. But unfortunately, in, in some places, there was some, some fascinating work done by some Harvard economists on the cultural norms around cell phone ownership in India. And still you have this kind of culture of, or this, you know, premarital purity that people are concerned about women not being able to retain if they have that that cell phone and can be contacted by men randomly through through the phone and you see that very much when women do own phones the kinds of apps they gravitate to are the ones where they are in more control of who can have access to them but you What's been so interesting is you've seen, you know, really across the generations, you've really started to see that um, that that ice uh, start to melt a bit, a bit, uh, a bit, and you're seeing greater access, if for no other reason because it's meant 
access to government relief payments. And that's been a, a, a huge, a huge mechanism to, to drive. Can you that speak to that? You, you had talked about India making the decision to provide COVID relief payments only to women last year. Is that is? It's really, it was astonishing decision on their part and, and really exciting. I mean, you know, say what you will about the, the current government in, in India, but they have been extraordinarily far cited in terms of financial inclusion. And for many years, they'd had a, you know, a digitally available um, biometric identification. They had a, a digitally available uh, low frills banking account that every household in India had to have. And, and the important word there is household. Most of those accounts were held by men in the households. So by driving digitally delivered government payments only to women saying COVID relief is going to women, you had in, in a little over two weeks, you had 25 million new bank accounts opened. And again, primarily for women and, and, and through that, that cell phone. So it was a, a, I think, really bold move. Peru was the only other country that explicitly um, made, drove payments to, uh, to women, but I think the, the, the real, the exciting part, but also the real challenge for those of us who really care about these issues is now that we've got them in the sector, in the, in the formal financial sector, how do we keep them and how do we make mm -hmm. sure that they continue to be served? Yeah, are these changes so, durable and will policy help to nudge culture? Great. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Can I do <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so that, that money was available regardless of employment status? If you're a homemaker, if you're a caregiver, you still got that. Exactly. Okay, interesting. Exactly. Huh. I think Argentina did something similar too. Oh, for women only. Oh, I didn't realize yeah. that. I knew I knew Peru. I didn't know Argentina. Yeah, uh, it was uh, like a caregiving stipend, which of course is always you know nowhere in the yes. world do men do more caregiving than women. So. <laughs> No, and that, you know we're we're leaping ahead a little bit, but no, that's that's a really there was a caregiving stipend in Argentina. I think Togo interest Togo has been you know it's a little tiny African yeah. country, but they've been so far sighted in the way the thoughtful way they've driven relief payments. They're getting exactly as Alicia's saying, you know, caregiving has been yeah. you know, it's always been the big disparity, the big mm. inequity, but boy, has it at home in COVID. Mm. And so governments that have been savvy about that, making sure that, that there is additional payment or additional facilities as people start to come out of COVID, but maybe not go back to work. Um, it, that, those have been really some of the most farsighted governments. So yeah, I, I was aware of that. This was, this mm. was more that initial first wave, sort of everybody gets gets the payment based on, yeah. on yeah. We're gonna, we're gonna um, dig into the care economy um, in a bit, but Alicia, there's so much that Mary Ellen just teed up, but a lot of your reporting is focused in, uh, focused in on what's happening in the US, although your recent column that had uh, was focused on kind of straddling two, two worlds. Um, how, how do Mary Ellen's comments reflect what you're seeing among women in the US? Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Um, so I know that everyone is really sick of, of negative news, but honestly, <laughs> I have to say that women in the US, particularly mothers, particularly women of color, are still not okay. Unfortunately, you know, it's, we're a year and a half in. It's still it's going to take years and years for all of this to smooth over. Um, I just want to sort of zoom out for a second to, to put things into perspective. So before the pandemic, women in the US were already at a disadvantage, right? Women's labor force participation between 1990 and 2010 was more or less stagnant. It was, it was you know, I think it was January, 2020. It was the first time since 2010 that women had outnumbered men in the US workforce. So, you know, we were, there was really, slow progress here. And also the gender pay gap, you know, in since 1996, it's only narrowed by eight cents, right? Um, and, you know, there have been a number of studies into why this is the case here in the US, why have been have women been sort of lagging behind men, whereas other countries, women's labor force participation has been rising. And, you know, a lot of it comes down to inflexible work schedules, 
uh, an inadequate care infrastructure, which again, we will get into a workplace culture of being constantly on. Um, so all of this was already, you know, floating around before the pandemic. So really it, it came as to, it came as no surprise for researchers and economists in this space that when the pandemic hit, it, it just exacerbated these uh, fault lines, right? It sort of just accelerated everything. And what we were seeing, when we were seeing those historic job losses at the start of the pandemic, it quickly became very clear that this is the first time in, U in the US that this, it's a female recession, right? Because women were in jobs that were hit hardest and women were taking on the care burden at home. So everything that was already broken got became more broken, right? Um, so today we're sort of more than halfway through 2021 and women's labor force participation has regressed to roughly 57%, which is what it was in 1988. It set back an entire generation. And since, since February, 2020, um, the, the economy has lost over 5.3 million jobs in total and women made up 56% of those losses. So it's really, it's to, to this day, they're doing not, they're not okay, right? But, but here's the silver lining. Um, this is sort of so massive, this once in a lifetime crisis, it is so big that it has gotten the attention of lawmakers across the country, right? What was, as I said, what was broken is now more broken. And finally, there's real talk of fixing it. Um, I interviewed Senator Patty Murray in April and she, and she put it really nicely. These issues are finally getting prime time attention, right? So as we speak, Congress is in negotiations of how to, you know, what to do, the build back better, build better again uh, package. Um, so, you know, things are changing day by day. And so we, we, we can only wait and see, but that's the only silver lining I can see here. <laughs> your, your point about attention, um, Janet Yellen said recently that uh, childcare is a textbook example of a broken market. So. Secretary of Treasury addressing uh, child care is uh, kind of an, an, an addition, a, a new narrative, let's say. Mm. Um, yeah. So the pandemic clearly has laid bare the issues that we face here and around the world mm. in terms of inadequate child care options and underpaid child care workforce. It was a competitive, mm -hmm. sorry, Alicia, uh, the Post did a good piece, I think it was yesterday, on mm -hmm. this um, specifically. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, so let's drill down on the drill economy. Um, can you, Alicia, talk about the value of unpaid care work and its impact? You've, you've kind of taken us there, but kind of central to the impact on women's economic mobility. Yeah. So, so building on what you said about Janet Yellen, she also mentioned in that same speech that she wouldn't be where she is today if she didn't have an excellent babysitter. So, you know, it all... It all Ties think, up, you know, good for you. Up. I should have brought that up too, right? As yeah, a it all connects. Um, so, so I think there's there are a few things that a lot of people who maybe are not in this space they, they might not be aware of. The cost of childcare in the U.S. has doubled since 1999, and it's 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 rising at a faster rate than even the cost of housing and prescription drugs, right? And I think for people who are watching from outside of the US, I also need to add that the US does not have any paid parental leave. It all depends on where you work and how generous your employer is. So, so what happens when a family has a child? Uh, someone has to sacrifice their career because the math of having both parents at work and paying for childcare that is unaffordable for so many people, it just does not add up, right? So more often than not, it's the mother who steps back. Um, but again, I don't want to frame childcare as a woman's issue because it's also, a, it's, a, it's a household issue. It's an economic issue. It's, it's a problem for men if most of your paycheck is going toward childcare. It is also a problem for men if your employees can't come into work, right? Um, and, and there has been a study and it you know, sort of estimates that the childcare crisis cost the United States an estimated $57 billion a year in lost earnings, productivity, and revenue. So it's clearly an economic issue. And again, I, I wanna come back to, uh, maybe I can throw back to Mary Ellen because the childcare crisis 
isn't unique to America, right? There's no, as I mentioned earlier, no country in the world where men and women do equal amount of caregiving duties and, and unpaid labor. So um, a new study published in April by the National Bureau of Economic Research found that the collapse of childcare set women back around the world. Um, and funnily enough, actually a week before the pandemic hit, so this was March 5th, I was looking it up just as I was preparing this, March 5th last year, Oxfam released a report suggesting that if women around the world were paid for the work that they do, they would have earned $10 trillion. And I'm sure that estimate is far higher now because of course schools close, childcare close, so there's a lot more going on. But I mean, just imagine that what, how much we're losing out because of these unpaid duties. Mary Ellen, I'm sure you have an anecdote or two about yeah. um, childcare conditions and challenges outside of the US. Just, just a, a couple of thoughts that were firing from from Alicia's remarks. You know, the, you know, the, the one thing that I always find remarkable, and I'm embarrassed to say that I only learned, you know, relatively late into into my career, is that that unpaid care is not factored into the calculation of GDP. So, mm -hmm. you know, the 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 uh, who is it that is referred to it as the, you know the work that makes all other work possible? You know, everything mm -hmm. else that does get factored into GDP. You know, this is this does does not um, does not count. I did hear again. Maybe I'm being a little bit more of a Pollyanna than I should be here, but I I I did hear a really interesting um, tidbit about um, AXA, the global insurance company, mm -hmm. when they calculate um, you know a husband and wife's life insurance, they do calculate you know the cost of that unpaid labor that either husband or wife. Are, um, are, are providing, because it does, it, as, as Alicia very you know, eloquently said, it does represent a, a, you know, a huge drain, impact the loss of that, that caregiver in a family's, um, in, in a family's life is, is dramatic in, in emotional as well as economic ways. So I thought that was really interesting that they've, you know, they've taken that aboard in the way they're thinking about mm -hmm. um, about uh, about care caregiving and and the and the cost of it, um, you know. And again, in this in this this mode of being perhaps a little bit more you know positive, one thing that we are starting to see, and it's become so important in as I was saying earlier, the access to technology, women's comfort with technology. Um, you know, they'll get a phone, they'll open WhatsApp, that tends to be the most popular app in the emerging mm -hmm. markets, and then they'll never leave, they'll never visit any other part of the internet. And so, you know, making sure that women have access and are, and, and are comfortable using it is so important. We've seen um, in some of our interviews in some of the countries that we work in, women saying, they're gaining sort of the household advantage in technology, even vis-a-vis -vis their husbands, as they've had to navigate remote schooling for their kids. Uh -huh. So that, you know, so much of what drives women's empowerment really is around that household bargaining, household decision-making. So, you know, we're always very alert to any time that a woman's sort of position in the household can be raised by virtue of, of access to finance, access to technology. Hmm. It's like you, uh, what is the catalyst, right? What are the catalysts? And it takes a pandemic to get us to, <laughs> to, to find yeah. some of the answers. This discussion is so much a state of the state, but it's also kind of what's next. So your comment uh, about AXA, like what would cause them to do that? So Alicia, are there some other, or both of you, are there some other examples of private companies, public companies, mm -hmm. companies stepping up during COVID uh, uh, to address the childcare issue, but maybe even more broadly, uh, mm. re-examining their approach to women employment. Yeah, I, I just wanna add something, Mary Allen. I, I don't know exactly where I read this and I might have my facts wrong. So please don't come after me if this is fake news. But um, I, I think I read somewhere that you know, when they were devising the GDP, there was a female economic researcher on their team and she wanted to include unpaid I labor. I read the same thing. So if it's yeah. fake, we both read. <laughs> we're both, okay, there we go. And so, you know, of course, who wants to listen to the woman on the table? Um, all right. <laughs> These two was at the table, all right? All right, so, okay. Yeah, so, um, 
so yes, examples. Um, I just need to I just need to circle up on a on a thought that I had earlier. The the childcare workers in the U.S. are among the lowest paid workers in the U.S. They they earn less than even kindergarten teachers and school teachers, and so they're they're and they don't have any benefits. A lot of them actually live on um, in poverty and live on benefits uh, from the government subsidies and things like that. And um, you know these are predominantly women and women of color. So so you know, as Mary Ellen said, this is the work that gets other work done, and yet they're very undervalued at the moment. And so what we're seeing is a lot of them are not returning to work. They're not able to come back to work, first of all, because a lot of childcare centers shut down over the pandemic, but also they're not coming back because it's dangerous, they're undervalued, they could go to a kindergarten and get double what they were earning, you know? And so when we're, when we're talking about the US economy going back to normal, it's really tough for people with younger kids. They can't find childcare. It's still, it's still not there, right? Um, so one of the examples that um, I, I was really struck by actually came from Hawaii. Um, the Hawaii um, local government has a commission on feminist policies. I, don't, I can't remember the exact title of the, the, the government commission. And what they did when COVID hit was they realized that single moms are probably in the worst possible case because they literally have to choose between going to work or staying at home, right? And if they're staying at home, they can't have anyone else sort of take on the care, caregiving duties or swap on and off. And so what they did was they sent um, laptops free of charge to single mothers across the country. And I think because of the way that motherhood is sort of never really centralized in government policy or whatever it is, one of these mothers called the police and she said, hey, I got a free laptop. Is this a scam? Where is it coming from? I don't want this free laptop. She just had never received help from the government before that she thought this was a joke, right? And so I think that really goes to show how difficult life can be for single mothers and then how easy it is to help them feel, you know, a little, a little relief, right? Just one Power. little thing, send them a laptop. Um, so let, let's talk about private companies. A lot of the largest companies in the US, Apple, Bank of America, Amazon, and so on, they provided extra weeks of pay, extra weeks of paid leave, and they subsidized certain childcare. But um, a lot of companies had to go beyond that because as I mentioned, childcare was closed. Nannies were impossible to find. So what good is subsidies for childcare? You can't really use that. Um, so for example, Verizon gave employees a stipend of up to $100 a day that they could use to pay anyone, like whether that's a neighbor or a friend or you know grandparents to come in and look after their kids. So it's not that they have to go and look for a professional and you know they didn't have to show that they're using this money on a professional service. They could use it on, on anything. And then um, there's a company in Portland called Kinesis, which hired a teacher. It's a small company. They have, I think, less than 50 employees. They hired a teacher and they set up learning pods in their office so that you know employees could send their children in. Um, Procter & Gamble created sort of their own set of online classes. So I think what the pandemic did was not only reveal all the fault lines, but also force companies to be really creative because it's no good just sort of saying, okay, here's some time off and here's some money, because what are you supposed to do with that? Jean, can I just, just call out one thing? Um, I, I was really struck by your, your um, you know, the trust story from the, the, mm -hmm. the woman in Hawaii. And I, and I think there's a, there's a re really interesting trust dynamic. Certainly, you know, any of us in finance know that, you know, the whole house of cards is built on, yeah. on mm -hmm. trust. And you know, one of the things that I always look for every year is um, Edelman does a trust barometer where they look at they you know they talk to people around the world and they ask about the level of trust of government, business, the media, and the nonprofit sector. And in industry, financial services are always dead bottom last. I mean, always. And it was it was really fascinating. The report that they published in, this is, always comes out in January, in January of 2020. So looking, you know, back to 2019, same as it ever was, you know, bottom of the barrel. But they did an update in May post-COVID. 
And they showed that, that actually among industries, the financial services industry had gone up to second place. And people had really called out the fact that banks and government had partnered on relief on you know getting immediate action they were frontline providers there was this momentary blip i you know i don't know how much of that has lasted they did i think mm -hmm. the financial services was still looking pretty good in january 2021 but I, <laughs> I do think again it's this sort of this moment to, mm -hmm. to change a dynamic to change yeah. people's perceptions of their yeah. employers of their government of yeah. their um of where they where they bank where they want mm -hmm. to bank um, so there, there is, a, I think, a, a potential to shift that that trust dynamic. Yeah, that's such a good point. And, you know, it, it's like, it, it just goes to show how much we were doing without. Right? <laughs> that's a great point. It's a great point. Yeah. yeah. It, it's like we so had all we need zero is just a little more. more. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, uh, you didn't mention healthcare. Um, you know, healthcare. Uh, the industry itself has been at the front line mm. and um, any examples of healthcare companies that may have been actually more empathetic to what's happening. And um, because working from home in many cases was not an option, you had to have people in uh, providing that care in person. Are you seeing examples of the healthcare industry uh, stepping up in, in a similar way? I haven't heard anything on that. I haven't What's either. I, and and I'm going to do you know maybe the a, a, a bad panelist thing, but I I didn't oh, want our I didn't want our our time together um, to to come to an end without calling out just one of the things that got way worse for women everywhere in the world was gender based violence, and mm -hmm. particularly during the lockdown period, you you saw crisis line phone calls you know mm. up the roof as shelters had to close because of because of the pandemic and you know we have women's world banking has pioneered a um a very low cost insurance product that kind of covers the the non-medical costs or the costs that might not be covered by say a national insurance plan so transportation in some countries you actually have to pay for house um, healthcare nursing care in, in the hospital doesn't sort of come with um, you know any any sort of additional cost and that was interestingly that product was allowing hospitals in many of the countries we work on to get in to get a a, a, a line of sight into women who might be in abusive situations and perhaps be able to, to help. Mm -hmm. We saw women, you know, just not going to hospitals. People were not mm -hmm. going if they didn't have, you know, if they didn't have COVID, they were not getting mm -hmm. anywhere near the hospital. And so, mm -hmm. you know, many of our partners, many of the, the healthcare providers in the countries we're working in really call that out that sort of this horrible, conundrum of knowing the problem was worse, but but really having even less insight as to just who was being hurt and, and how um, how that could help. Unfortunately, now, you know, sort of 18 months into it, we're, we're starting to see the, the repercussions and you've seen, you know, several countries that had really had tremendous reductions in child marriage um, over the last few years, that has just really turned, mm -hmm. uh, turned back around as, yep. You know, young girls were abused and have gotten pregnant and now married in um, the post-COVID period. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, we're just scratching the surface. Um, I, I think probably um, I'd, I'd like to kind of pivot a little bit, um, but similar uh, kind of front and center federal got dollars getting to families. I'm, I'm, um, we can certainly broaden this, uh, uh, Mary Ellen, but to Alicia, um, just weighing in on the soft provisions within the uh, infrastructure bill, you know, what does it mean for families? And um, certainly as that policy or that um, bill is being shaped or potentially reshaped, uh, what we should be paying attention to is using mm -hmm. the plans. So I think um, it would be historic if they are able to implement universal pre-K childcare here in the US. 
that really would be historic. I think we need to, the devil is always in the details. We have to pay attention on how that's done. Um, so I recently did a story on the differences between childcare in the US um, sort of like normal marketplace versus childcare provided by the Defense Department for military families. It is actually rated as one of the best childcare systems in the US um, con constantly. Um, and that's because, you know, when they switched um, to a, a volunteer service, they had to attract families, they had to retain talent. And so they, they allowed, they, you know, they sort of figured out early on that they need to be thinking about what these families need, what kind of benefits they need. And that includes state of the art childcare. And they pay their childcare workers much better than childcare workers are paid in the civilian world. Uh, they, they make sure that there are mandatory sort of inspections of the space so that they're safe. Um, and, you know, at, because when during, especially during COVID, they had to be sort of socially distant, clean, all of that. And they, um, they subsidize parent fees. They, they subsidize a lot of how much parents pay out of pocket. And they give a lot of money directly to the, um, the child care center itself, right? So they, they can sort of budget in maintenance and teacher fees by themselves without it going on to the parent, like it, without, without the, the cost of that being carried by the parent. And so if we, if, if this um, package that's working its way through Congress, you know, implements pre-K, we, we, we need to look at what, what I'm looking for, especially is how they're gonna be using that money. Are they gonna be using that money as parent subsidies, or are they going to actually use that money to increase pay for, for workers and to you know, have mandatory um, accreditation and to have mandatory and to give programs that money so they can maintain their, their um, centers to up, to, up to par. So I think that's, that's where I'm looking for childcare. And then there's also, of course, a lot of other benefits when it comes to community college, and it comes, there's just a whole slew of things that are sort of whirling around. And my focus has been childcare, of course. Um, so I think that's, that's what I'm looking for. So um, how about, uh, let me remind everyone to be putting questions into the Q&A function. Um, I'm going to take a little bit more time, um, and, but then we're going to pivot to all of you. Um, uh, I really just... Mary Ellen, you wanted to get to a few things. I'm given my world. Um, you've spent a lot of time looking at women's financial literacy. And so this is really for both of you. How does the lack or um, maybe deficiency on uh, financial literacy impact women's ability to build wealth? This is all kind of with this idea of what do we look like? What does this curve look like coming out of this highly unusual period? So addressing financial literacy as, a, as an ingredient. So I think a lot of the way we've started talking about it actually is, well, almost never in, never in the breath that we say financial literacy, do we not also say digital literacy because mm. they are so interlinked, particularly throughout the emerging markets, but also this idea of capability that it's, it's sort of not just sort of un, an understanding, but a, a confidence. There, there's some amazing data that comes out every year. There's a you know, global study on, on financial literacy and, you know, men and women will also often get you know the identical test answers from each other but men will tell you they've done so well and they know all the answers and women are just so sure that they've not addressed they've not gotten the right answers um they're 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 much less um certain and confident about making about making financial decisions um so there's there's you know, there's all of those those issues that we we feel need to be addressed as a whole. But I think it, it what it often goes to for us, and really where where we focus a lot of our activity is working with financial service providers, 
because there is just so much data about what good clients women are when they come into the formal financial sector. And you know, one of the most interesting sort of data points we've seen during COVID, um, you know, as you mentioned, Women's World Banking is an impact investor. We have two um, two funds that invests in financial service providers that do serve women and have women in their management leadership, but. Um, most of the countries we were working in had debt moratoria. So they were, you know, people were not required to pay loans for most of last year. And you saw certainly in our portfolio of, of banks and microfinance institutions and in other financial providers, you saw significant, be significantly better um, repayment rates by women than by men even during that moratorium. Women understand how hard that access to finance is mm -hmm. to get in the first place and are going to do everything they can to make sure that they don't lose it and that they are, that they are maintaining that payment. We've also seen you know, a lot more, um, you know, in Indonesia, for example, um, they, the government took a very successful digital conditional cash transfer program that was already serving women in order to um, improve um, health uh, and uh, child health and education out outcomes. They doubled that payment or made it more a more frequent payment and continued to deliver it to, to women. We had women saying, wow, this is a lot more money than we're used to getting can we save it? And how do we go about saving it? And is this actually a bank account that I can save in? And do I have to let my husband know that I'm getting this additional money to save because he may not want me to save it for a rainy day? So we, we've just seen this, this influx of government relief payment really prompting lots of lots of questions for women entrepreneurs who are overwhelmingly operating in, in developing countries in the informal sector. So they're not registered businesses. They were not eligible be, precisely because they were not registered for any small business um, relief that a government might have made, made available. And we're anecdotally, I don't have hard data on this yet, but we're starting to see more women recognizing that going into the formal economy you know, really does have benefits. I think a lot of it gets back to that, that trust. A lot of it gets back to um, what financial service providers are seeing they have to do if they're going to bring women clients or keep women clients um, on board. I, I asked actually, before, uh, sorry, go ahead. I just wanna to add to that. You know, I think, so I've been reporting on how the recent child tax credit have actually been used by families or how families are receiving, you know, how they're feeling about them. And time and again, I speak to these women with, with multiple children and they're just shocked. <laughs> they're just shocked because, you know, um, the US financial system is ex extremely exclusionary for people of color particularly women of color. And, and even when it came to benefits before the pandemic, it was always tied to your income level or you know, whether you are actually working, like your, your working status. You couldn't get child benefits um, unless you were actually looking for a job or working, and, but then nobody realized it's a catch-22 because you can't look for a job until you have help at home. Anyway, so you know, there's all these exclusionary policies. And so when these women receive these checks, no questions asked, no strings attached, they're just, they're just stunned, right? And they're not going on spending sprees. They're literally buying school books, school books for their kids, getting their kids braces or, you know, grocery shopping and, and being able to afford the healthy food, right? So I think it's, I think the wealth inequality is such a huge, such a huge uh, byproduct of the racial exclusion in America, you know, historically, but also it's, it's, it's only in, in the 1970s that women got access to credit cards, right? And so it's really, we're that. really not, we're really not <laughs> doing that great over here. I hate to come back to that, but we're really not. And, um, I, and I was telling, I was telling uh, uh, Jane earlier when we were speaking last week, the Grameen Bank, which is, as you know, Mary Ellen, the, the microfinance group, they opened up a US branch because of the fact that a lot of women, women of color don't have access to finance here. 
it's uh, we could probably dedicate an entire session to uh, financial literacy broadly. Um, we are going to have a call to action at the end, and I'm I'm making a note of that. Um, I am. I think a couple of of questions um, that have come from our audience are uh, really pressing. I'd love to get to um, one being how women. How have you seen women empowering other women, especially in terms of creating businesses that enable financial inclusion for women? So kind of. Uh, there's a lot in there. Um, it is interesting, certainly new business formation and uh, and women's involvement in that. It gets a little bit to Mary Ellen's point about the informal versus the formal economy, but some responses, are we helping each other? That's a great question. I, I you know, one, one sort of anecdotal thing I can tell you from Women's World Banking, um, we've been running a FinTech innovation challenge for the last few years where we're, looking for businesses, fintechs that are explicitly focused on either helping women, low-income women build prosperity through, you know, alternative credit scoring or some other, you know, credit mechanisms or resilience, insurance, savings. And um, we, you know, you always hear that no, there aren't any women in fintech and it's such a founder-driven business and there are no female founders. We have been inundated with some of the most fascinating business proposals and business models. And the vast majority of the applicants that we receive are female founders. And so, so much so, um, this year, our, our FinTech Innovation Challenge will be held virtually on October 12th. So uh, we'd love to see some of you there. Mm -hmm. But we were so you know, overwhelmed by the number of female founders that we're giving a special female founders award this year in addition to um, awarding um, the, the FinTech uh, innovator. But it, it was, it's been fascinating talking to these companies and the things that they're doing. And uh, they're, you know, everybody wants all their developers to be women, to be more inclusive. But we had you know, one company that set up a boot camp to develop a pipeline of women coders to go into um, the, the company at, when they graduate specifically from the boot camp, and we're financing that 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 STEM education. So I'm I'm again very heartened that at least in the financial technology space, there does seem to be a real cadre of women very concerned about not only helping women clients but also making sure that they're they're doing so in an inclusive workplace. This outside of the U.S. or U.S.-based businesses? It's been, we've we've opened it to both, but we've and we've been very you know gratified to see there some some great U.S. companies as well as of, uh, as emerging more. Well, actually, I'm sorry, the companies are all serving um, international populations, right? But some of them are you know female founders and other founders here in the U.S. that are are serving a, a, a foreign population. I want to I want to highlight a company in the U.S. that just to give them a little shout out. Um, it's called Otter and they started Spelling? in the pandemic. How do you spell that? O-T-T-E-R. Like the mammal, or, okay, yes. Yeah, Otter family, maybe something like that. Um, they started in the pandemic. Uh, the, it's run by this, wo this woman, she has two kids. She lost her job in the pandemic. She couldn't find a new one where they were flexible. So she started Otter um, where they basically pay um, sort of stay-at-home moms to look after ch other children if they're willing to, right? So if you have a neighbor, for example, and that, that person is at a phase in their life where they don't, where they're, they're not working right now, you can drop your kids off and you can pay them for it. And so it creates this care economy where women are empowering other women. You're, you're not just using up their time and energy, you're giving them money for it. Um, you know, it's sort of, it's kind of brilliant. <laughs> it's and pragmatic and mm -hmm. in your yard. Yeah, like you can't find a nanny. Sure, you can use someone else. You can use your friend and at least pay her for the time that she's put in. Yeah, we've talked a lot about the cost of childcare, but we haven't really addressed the quality of care. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I, I think they come hand in hand. You're not, but they are trade offs. Um, you know. Actually, uh, one of the questions that did come in staying with childcare was 
have you seen, um, where have you seen um, uh, child care models that have worked best? Uh, and, and specifically calling out the Scandinavian models uh, as, as successful. Um, any, any thoughts along uh, taking a global view? So I, you know, yeah, I, I think Scandinavian model is always sort of far ahead when it comes to gender issues. But um, like I mentioned earlier, I think in the US we do have an example that works, it's the military. They yeah, have did. really yes. cracked, they've cracked that nut and they've figured it out. And if you, if you would like, please go and read my story. It's got a history of how they did that. And I think, you know, the woman who, the woman who actually engineered that, her name is Linda Smith. Um, she has been in conversation with lawmakers, policymakers, you know, so she's always in contact with Congress and she's working with them on this current package. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> That's great. Um, Mary Ellen, anything to add on, on models um, that, have, that you're encouraged by? Well, you know, as I, I, even the champion for Togo, as I, I said, you know, um, similar to Alicia's points about, you know, the really revolutionary changes in policy here that might be possible if we start adding, as you said, sort of the soft issues in, in the infrastructure bill. You, you've had governors, governments, Bosnia, Togo, you know, Argentina that Alicia mentioned that have, have really dedicated their aid in specific ways to support women in, in childcare and the, the issues that women are facing as opposed to sort of more blanket relief, but being very, very tailored to, to women's needs. So um, I did say that we were gonna close by coming back to this idea of collectively making a difference. Um, which is at the heart of our, our series. And um, we're fortunate to have a network of influential women who are committed to helping lift up all women. It's embedded in one of the questions we were just addressing. Can uh, each of you take a moment uh, to just tee up one or two actions that members, all of us who are in attendance today, um, what actions can we uh, take to make a difference? You want to go first, Alicia? No, you go first. No, oh, all right. Um, so, um, you know, I would be remiss as the leader of an NGO not to say visit womensworldbanking.org, our website, um, and the FinTech Innovation Challenge registration. I saw someone asked about that in the chat. Um, you, can, you can register and we'd love to see you on October 12th. It's always a really, really fun event. Um, and if your hand somehow slides across the donate button, I know we would be absolutely <laughs> thrilled to have you there. But I think maybe even, even more or as impactfully, you know, I, I always tell women it's, we are consumers of financial services and we should vote with our feet. It is so, it is actually very easy to see how well the bank that you bank with, the insurance company that you um, receive your insurance policies with, the financial uh, advisor that you use, how well they are treating women and how well, you know, the, how inclusive they are of women in their, um, in, in as employees. And, and that really matters. It, it really, it really can make a difference if you are an informed, educated consumer of those of those services. And, you know, more and more, these financial service providers are, are very well aware of the, the amount of wealth that is transferring to women, that women are self-creating, that there's a recognition of that. And yet there seems to be a real um, confusion about how to attract those customers. And so I, I always encourage women to, to show them the way, show them the things that really matter to them and be an informed consumer of those services. I'm going, to, I'm going to come back to what I said earlier. The silver lining of all of this is that there is attention now on these on these issues that we touched on. Um, you know, so you know, if you're, I think, uh, if you're an executive at a company, be creative. Help the women out. Help the parents out. And if you're working at a at a you know at a company where you have maybe negotiating power, 
I think you're in a position to really demand flexible schedules, better pay, childcare stipends. This is a real inflection point. But again, I, I keep coming back to those low income workers, wage workers who really don't have that negotiating power. And I think that's where Mary Ellen comes in, right? It's like how, you know, getting, getting access to finance, being able to lift yourself up. Um, you know, these, the government policies like the child tax credit, it's going a long way from, from the research that I've seen. Um, I think it's if you have the power to advocate for for the things that you think are important, do that because, you know, I know of women who have been fired simply for asking for time off to go pick up a laptop for their kid and you know for remote schools and there's a lot of people don't have the negotiating power and I think if you do have it then you should use it. Use it. And uh, I, I I know that there is data that points to the connection between reproductive rights and economic productivity um, and to the extent that all of us have a voice, um, whatever side you, you fall on, there, there are, uh, it's, it's all part of the mix um, in terms of mobility and resilience and choice. So uh, at that, um, I wanna thank Alicia and Mary Ellen. You've shared so many insights uh, and we know that we've just scratched the surface. I've said that a couple of times, certainly as we were preparing for this, uh, we could make days of this discussion. Um, we really do want to make a difference. And so uh, I'm also going to thank our partner, IWF, um, who is an advocate of, of change and advocate for women, uh, create settings like this for us to share information uh, the hundreds, I will say hundreds of guests who have joined us in conversation. It's gratifying to see how many people um, are motivated by this, uh, by this topic. Hopefully you've been further motivated by some of the, the insights and um, updates that we've been getting. Um, I'm, I look forward to us coming back to this subject and see where we are uh, next year and beyond uh, is we all know this is not a one and done. Um, and speaking of not one and done, we'll hope that all of you will join us for the second and third webinars in our mm -hmm. Raising Women's Voices series. Uh, you should have received an invitation, but if you have not, you can reach out to any of us um, at Brown. Um, uh, so again, in October and November. And apropos to Raising Women's Voices, we hope to hear from all of you soon. Thank you again.